Okay, hey everybody, welcome to the Adjust Your TV Facebook Live Show. <clears throat> I'm really, really excited to have you all here today. Okay, today we're going to talk about the, just the basic homeowner's property policy. And I downloaded an HO5 from the internet. Um, and I think it's from Pennsylvania, but it doesn't really matter because if you're a CAT adjuster and you're traveling a lot, you're going to be getting a lot of different policies from a lot of different states. Um, and really, we're just going to go over the main parts of the policy that you're likely to have to deal with as a CAT property adjuster. And I'll touch on a few highlights, and at the end, we'll do a Q&A. And then after that, I'll send you over to AdjusterTV.com, where I've got some homework assignments for you. Um, it shouldn't take you too long, but it'll be a good exercise for digging into the policy and getting used to seeing where things are at um, in the policy. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Matthew Allen. And I've been an independent property cat adjuster for nearly 20 years. I took a couple of brief breaks in there to sell roofs, um, which, <laughs> let's be honest, I was not very good at it, but I did learn a lot. And to be a staff adjuster for Liberty Mutual uh, under their Safeco brand for just about a year. So, But in my heart, I'm an IA. And I think I'm to a point now in my career where I really want to give back uh, what I've learned over the years in the hopes that you guys can benefit from my experience. And uh, while we're at it, if there's anybody you know who you could think could benefit from this video, please share it with them. Um, okay, just to be sure that everybody can hear and see me okay, uh, just give me a quick thumbs up in the comments. Uh, again, we're going to break down the homeowner's policy and go over just the main parts that will concern you as a cat adjuster. All right, let's get started. So this is the um, HO5. This is a replacement cost policy for the most part. Um, <clears throat> and basically the, the, the main parts of the policy that you might be uh, needing con to concern yourself with, we're going to start on the first page um, with the definitions. And then the next part, um, and we're going to go back uh, through this whole thing and, and kind of do a, a deep dive. But for now, we're just going to jump in and uh, just touch on the high just touch on the high points just sort of the main parts of the policy so um, property coverages this is where you're going to find stuff about your dwelling other structures uh, personal property additional living expense um, special limits of liability and all that stuff and then we will go ahead and hit uh, loss of use is in there scrolling down scrolling down I got these uh, highlighted so I can I could hit them, but there's a lot of stuff under uh, property coverages. Hold on a second, did I miss it? No, man. A lot of stuff in there. So, um, we're going to be touching on some of this stuff, but not a whole lot of it because, again, as cat adjusters, we're... Just, Mainly concerned with the weather and wildfire and earthquakes. Those are going to be our main things that we're ever going to deal with. And generally, it's going to be num absolutely number one. It's going to be the weather and it's going to be wind. Um, occasionally, you'll get, you know, once every couple, two, three, four years, you might get a wildfire. And then I haven't worked at an earthquake yet, and I've been doing this since 99. I think the last big one was uh, Northridge, so that was back in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> next section we're concerned with is perils insured against. And this lists out... Um, Strangely, it tells you in one sentence right here, um, we ensure risk of direct physical loss of property described in A, B, and C. And then it goes on for two pages and tells you what they do not insure, which is, you know, typical of insurance policies. And then the next section after that is exclusions, which is more of what we do not insure. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to we do a dive deep into this stuff. And then we have conditions. Um, main thing in here is going to be duties after a loss for the insured. Not this is going to be more a section where you're going to have to field questions from insureds more than really um, use it to make any coverage decisions. And then what else is in here? I got them highlighted so I could see them. I think that's it. So the rest of this stuff is liability. Um, and there's some things that may indirectly liberalization clause. I have no idea what that even is. So that's it. So that's it on for the kind of the highlights of the, of the policy. We'll go a little bit deeper here into the in-depth section. And really in this part, what, we, what we're mainly concerned about is um, who the insured is. 
And in this case, it says you and residents of your household who are your relatives or other persons under the age of 21 um, and in the care of any person named above. Um, probably not really going to be something that you're going to deal with a whole lot, but under certain circumstances, um, the insured may be deceased and or they may have a public adjuster and you're going to need to have a assigned a power of attorney in order to deal with anybody who is not a named insured or that is described in this section. So this is where this, you know, this is why this might affect you. Um, the next section we are interested in, and here under definitions is what a motor vehicle is, and this is a self-propelled land vehicle, um, land or amphibious vehicle um, is the main thing. So any sort of car, truck, um, a golf cart, um, it may even be like a riding mower, um, any self-propelled land or amphibious vehicle. So this is just one one thing to remember here is your uh, under definitions is motor vehicle. Um, residence premises, you've got your insured location, which includes the residence premises. Um, this is where the insured lives full time. This is their main home. So sometimes, you know, the only the time that this will be an issue with a catastrophe adjuster is if you go to some place where there's a lot of vacation homes, like on the coast uh, or up in the mountains near, you know. Aspen or Breckenridge, or there's some places up in Oregon where there's, you know, everybody's got vacation homes and they don't live there full time. If they have a loss at one of those those locations, this particular part of the policy could affect how you pay or if you can pay for a loss. Um, so it's important to kind of keep your eye on, have this sort of in your the back of your mind as, as uh, you know, when your insured tells you if that they, that it's their vacation property or it's their cabin up in the mountains and they only go up there a couple of weeks in the summer. Um, like I said, it may affect how you how you pay for the loss. Um, okay, and we move down here to property coverages under dwelling coverage A, uh, coverage B is other structures, coverage C is personal property, and of course, our good friend, coverage D, loss of use, which is additional living expense. Those are the main coverages that we deal with as catastrophe adjusters, and the dwelling is uh, mainly the the main house. Um, where, which is the residence premises, which is where the insured lives. Um, and interestingly, on this particular policy, it says materials and supplies located on or next to the residence premises used to construct, alter, or repair the dwelling or other structures on the residence premises. So if they have um, some construction material sitting in the driveway and you get a big hailstorm and that stuff gets ruined, under this, um, that can be covered under the dwelling coverage. Um, we never cover land. Um, so if, you know, well, we just, you know, if, if you have some hail that hits the yard and it puts a bunch of big dents in it or whatever, we're not paying for that. So uh, under coverage B, other structures, the main things we want to talk about here is the fact that other structures includes like detached garages, sheds, outbuildings. Um, it also includes uh, fences or uh, structures that are not buildings like fences. Um, it could include um, those tall like birdhouse things like you see people sometimes have like a, a pole in their yard the great big birdhouse sticking on top of it and it's like you know 25 feet in the air um, anything that's a structure that's stuck in the ground um, is going to be c considered an other structure under this particular coverage um, <clears throat> and again we do not cover land including land on which the other structure is located um, particular thing you want to pay attention to here is that other structures, uh, we do not cover other structures from which any business is conducted or other structures used to store business property. Um, there's a little bit of a clause here that differentiates between, um, we do cover a structure that contains business property solely owned by an insured or a tenant provided it doesn't have gas and liquid fuel and stuff like that. So basically what this means is, is if you are, um, if you own all of your business property that you're using for your business, say, for example, you're a, uh, if you're, or well, let's say this, if you're keeping inventory in your garage that you didn't pay for, it's not yours, it's not solely owned by you, then that's not going to be covered if it's in your garage. Um, and generally speaking, limit of liability on coverage B is 10% of A. So if you have a $500,000 um, house, you're going to have $50,000 on the garage unless 
they bought extra insurance to cover a nicer, bigger garage. The coverage C, personal property. Um, important thing here is that we cover personal property owned or used by an insured while as anywhere in the world. Um, a lot of people don't know that. They think their personal property has to be in the house. But if you go overseas and you take your camera and a bunch of stuff with you in your laptop and it gets stolen, it's covered. So, But again, that's not going to affect you as a cat adjuster. Um, really, really important part of this under uh, personal property is the special limits of liability. Um, and this tells you that certain things have a limit, $200 on money. So if a guy says, well, I had you know $1,000 in cash sitting on my nightstand and uh, when the fire happened, you can only give them two hundred dollars of that thousand um, dollars. The main thing for cat adjusters that we're going to be seeing, you're going to be seeing a, a frequently, are going to be trailers and uh, boats and things like that that are sitting parked in the backyard or on the side driveway or in the side of the house. Um, you've got limits here: fifteen hundred dollars on watercraft, um, including their trailers, furnishings, equipment. So if you have a a pontoon boat sitting on a trailer with a cover on it. Um, no, even if all of the three of those things are damaged, you can only pay for $1,500 of that. Um, $1,500 on trailers or semi-trailers not used with watercrafts, watercrafts of all type. And again, that's, you know, if you have a cargo trailer in the backyard or a flatbed trailer, um, used for, for, you know, hauling who knows what around, you know, hauling your side by side around or whatever, um, you're going to have $1,500 coverage for that. And a lot of times people are going to have, um, coverage for those things like they'll have a policy for the boat they might have if they have a nice side by side with a you know a four thousand dollar trailer or a car enclosed uh, cargo trailer something like that they're going to probably have uh, a policy a separate for those things and you, this is something that you need if they say that they have damage to those items you have to ask them well do you have coverage for that under another policy do you have like an auto or a, you know do you have insurance for those particular items and a lot of times people will say yes sometimes they say no and then you've got fifteen hundred dollars that you can play with um and again, here for this uh, this property on the residence premises used primarily for business purposes, um, this goes back up here to coverage B, other structures. Other structures used for business, um, there is coverage, even though there's not coverage for the structure um, under these circumstances, um, there is going to be $2,500 limit on your tools or whatever it is, you know, that you may have uh, that you use for your, for your business that you operate out of your house or your garage you know, or any, any place on your residence premises. Property not covered. This is where we're still under coverage C. Excuse me. Um, we do not cover articles separately described and specif specifically insured, regardless of the limit for which they insured in this or other insurance. What this means is, is if you have the guy has a fifteen thousand dollar Rolex, um, he's not just going to leave that up to his homeowner's policy to cover it. He's going to talk to his agent about getting a, a special endorsement or scheduling, is what they call it, um, that particular watch, and he'll have to get it appraised or show some documentation as to its specifications and its value. Um, this goes for like really nice engagement rings um, and any other pe piece of personal property that the insured wants to specially insure because it has high value or it's unique or it's something that, you know, if they have a loss that the, the policy isn't, isn't going to be able to cover it the way it should be. So you can you can pay extra to have those things scheduled out, which means that in this case, it's only covered under one of the, these things. It's either co covered under the homeowner's policy or it's covered under the schedule, um, the separate insurance that you can buy for it. So um, motor vehicles, we do not cover motor vehicles, um, which we described above as any land or amphibious uh, vehicle that, you know, is self-propelled. Um, there is an exception. We do cover motor vehicles not required to be registered for use on public roads or property, which are used solely to service and insures residents or designed to assist the handicap. So obviously a wheelchair, um, motorized wheelchair is going to be something that will be covered under the homeowner's policy. I've paid for all kinds of different things. I've paid for ATVs. I've paid for a pickup truck. I paid for golf carts. As long as the insured um, can show and this is one of those little bit of a gray area where sometimes you're giving the benefit of the doubt to the insured. They have an old beater pickup truck that, and they have four or five acres and they've got, you know, 
you can see that they've got a log splitter and a bunch of stuff, and they use that pickup truck only on the property. It doesn't have license plates on it. They don't ever take it to town. They don't ever drive it outside of the property. Then that's that can open up coverage for that particular pickup truck. Um, ATVs, same thing. Some people will have a bunch of ATVs and that they take to the sand dunes. Um, anything that's that they take off the property that's not used solely to service the insured uh, residents is not covered. So you can't, even though an ATV is not licensable on the road, um, generally speaking, if they take it, if it's used recreationally, it's they're, they're going to have to have their own policy for those things, so, or like their own little ATV policy or whatever. It was not going to be covered under their homeowner's insurance, generally speaking. Okay, moving along quickly. Uh, coverage D, loss of use. Um, you may or may not see a lot of loss of, loss of use stuff. Um, sometimes on big events, um, there's going to be um, ALE unit, which will handle additional living expense. So if you have a customer that's out of the house, um, they're probably going to be dealing with an ALE adjuster. Um, sometimes you might deal with it. But the key thing to remember for additional living expenses, two things is that the house needs to be not fit to live in. And a couple of examples you might get in the summertime when it's 104 degrees outside and it's, you know, you're in Houston and it's super humid and it's super hot and it's miserable to be anywhere that where there's not air conditioning. If the power goes out and the air conditioning isn't on, that doesn't make the house not fit to live in if you're a normal, healthy person. If you're 96 years old, um, this is something that could make that premises not fit to live in and would, would open up additional living expense per, um, possibly for them to go to a hotel. Same thing goes in the wintertime. If it's 20 degrees below zero and the power goes out, um, I'm giving somebody a hotel. They're not gonna, I'm not going to ask somebody to, I'm not going to deny additional living expense if it's, if it's super cold outside and they're, they want to live in their, or they don't want to live in their house because they've got little kids or they're just, you know, you know, human beings, it's not, you can't really tolerate that kind of temperature. Um, so I'm going to encourage people to go get a hotel and I would personally would pay for it. Um, but you know, additional living expense, if you deal with it at all, will also be something that will be addressed in your orientation. So the other thing is, is that, um, we cover necessary increase in living expenses. So in other words, if you spend a hundred, if the insurance spends a hundred dollars a week on food, uh, normally speaking, and then when they have a loss, the house is not fit to live in, they have to go stay in a hotel and they can't access the home for whatever reason, and they still only spend $100 a week on food, then there's no additional living expense extra for food. So they can't submit their restaurant bills if it doesn't go over what they've already spent. Now, if, if, they, if they normally spend $100 on food and while they're out of the house, they are spending $200 a week on food, well, there's another hundred dollars there because they've gone over their normal spending by a hundred dollars. So you can pay them uh, additional living expense for food for for the overage, the, the necessary increase in living expense, one hundred bucks. And again, they have to show kind of their you know their average grocery bills and how often they go out to eat and all that kind of stuff. And you got to sit down with them, which is generally speaking why there's a separate adjuster that handles living additional living expense because it, sometimes it can be very time consuming. So. All right, fun part, uh, additional coverages. So you have additional coverages for debris removal, which means that in this case, uh, debris uh, cover property for peril insured against that applies to the damage property causes the loss or uh, ash, dust, blah, 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 blah. Um, obviously, we've got volcanoes in Hawaii, so this might kick in for those guys. Um, this expense is not included in the limit of liability that applies to the damaged property. If the amount to be paid for the actual damage to the property plus the debris removal expense is more than the limit of liability for the damaged property, an additional 5% of that limit is available for debris removal expense. What this section means is, is that if you have a total loss in the house, the house is $100,000, and it costs $100,000 to, well, we'll say it costs $95,000 to uh, replace the house, just using a broad example here, and they have fifteen thousand dollars of uh, added on top of that for debris removal, so dumpsters and labor to tear things out and all that kind of stuff. So you've got ninety-five thousand dollars for replacement of the house, fifteen thousand dollars for you know tearing out what was destroyed and all the stuff that goes along with it. Well, that's a hundred and ten thousand dollar claim. What this is saying is is that you have an additional expense. 
of 5% of the limit of liability, so in this case the dwelling, which we said was $100,000, um, you have an additional 5% available for debris removal. So that's $5,000. So 5% you know, five of $100,000 is 5%. Or is five thousand dollars, so you can pay on this claim that in the, that I just described a hundred and five thousand dollars. So they're not going to be able to get that extra five thousand for the you know. So they're only going to get ten thousand out of the fifteen thousand for debris removal, if that makes any sense. So ninety five thousand dollar replacement, fifteen thousand in debris removal, and then which gives you a hundred and ten thousand, but we can only pay one hundred five. So. And that's that's basically how this little section shakes out. And sometimes you have like small like sublimits um, where this comes into effect, like on, for example, um, sewer and drain backup endorsements, uh, where there is coverage extended for water that backs up through a sewer sump pump um, or drain. Uh, those sometimes have a five thousand dollar limit, so you can only pay. You guys got a finished basement, you can only pay five thousand dollars of whatever he's got. This clause right here gives you an additional 5% of that 5,000, which is $250. So you're paying a lot of, um, you're writing a lot of checks for $5,250 on sewer and drain backup uh, events. So that's, you might see that a lot if you're going to be doing some sewer and drain backup stuff. <clears throat> okay, fallen trees. Um, this one, I, I'm really planning on doing a, um, a whole other one of these just on trees because trees can be, Trees can be a thing, um, and they can be confusing um, until you get a few of them under your belt. Um, but the sh long and short of it is, is that there is coverage. Um, there is coverage for trees that have been felled by windstorm or hail, or weight of ice, snow, or sleet. So if you have an ice storm and the tree falls over and hits the house, which right here is what it says damages the structure. Um, these two things will give you coverage for uh, hauling away. So this is this is under debris removal still. So um, this doesn't include what it reasonably costs to get the tree off of the house so that the repairs can be made. So if you have a tree that hits the house, guy comes out and it's going to be six thousand dollars to get this great big tree off of the house and to get the debris onto the ground, then you can pay the six thousand dollars or whatever five or six thousand dollars, whatever I said. Um, to get that tree off of the house so that repairs can be made. Um, but you've only got up to $1,000, and in this case, no more than 500 per tree is allowed. Um, so you have $6,000 to get the tree off the house, and then $500 to haul off the debris. Um, and that's kind of the way these these shake out. And again, I think we should do another one of these where we've got a bunch of examples and stuff. Um, all right. Moving along, reasonable repairs. We will pay the reasonable cost incurred by you for the necessary measures taken solely to protect covered property that is damaged by peril insurance insured against from further damage. And we're talking here, tarps uh, primarily. This is what you're going to see. So um, guys might blow through a neighborhood and tarp every roof in there and want $3,000 for it. Um, you're going to have to get with your management on hurricanes. Um, on typical windstorms in the Midwest, you know, 250, 350, 450 is what I usually, you know, is paying for tarps. Um, <clears throat> but you're going to see them all over the board when you get a hurricane. And this also goes for trees. You know, two guys might come out to the house. One guy will say, you know, it's two guys in a pickup truck with a chainsaw will say, yeah, we can do it for 250 bucks. And then the next guy that comes along wants $12,000 to do the same thing. So you're going to, it's going to be wild and crazy um, with the trees and stuff. So, all right. Um, we do cover trees, shrubs, and other plants um, on the residence premises, and this includes uh, tree, shrubs, plants, or lawns, but it's only for loss caused by the following perils insured against. So we've got these, was it A through G, that's seven, uh, fire, lightning, explosion, rider civil commotion, aircraft, uh, vehicles not owned by operated by resident of the residence premises, vandalism, or theft. So in this case, for our purposes, it's going to be fire or lightning. So wildfire, you can pay for trees. Um, if a tree gets struck by lightning, you can pay to replace it. But again, we're talking about a limit here, uh, which you find in this paragraph. Um, as doing daily claims and being a staff adjuster, you're going to see more of like this one right here. Uh, somebody 
loses control of their car and bl- blasts through the insured's drive or th- through their yard and takes out a bunch of you know landscaping plants and bushes and stuff, um, you're going to be paying for uh, replacing that stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So I'm just really powering through this because there's a whole lot to cover and I don't, you know, we're already 25 minutes in here um, and I don't want to, uh, I can't really stop to address questions. So we're again, we'll save those till the end. So um, interesting little clause here. We've got landlords furnishings. It says, you know, if you have a uh, multifamily home, like a fourplex or something like that, or you rent out like your basement, or maybe you have like an Airbnb, that's part of your house, um, you rent out that. Um, under this clause, it says we will pay up to $2,500 for your appliances, carpeting, and other household furnishings um, regularly rented, blah, 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 um, for only by the following perils insured against. And again, this, against. And again, this is a named peril section. Uh, oh, this includes spacecraft. Interesting. Uh, so named peril section. Um, and this particular paragraph right here, I want to draw your attention to uh, this peril does not include loss to the property contained in a building caused by rain, snow, sleet, sand, or dust unless a direct force of wind or hail damages the building, causing an opening in the roof or wall through which that stuff enters. Okay, so this is, you see this on policies um, that are for everything. In this particular case, this is only for landlord's furnishings. This is not for the insured stuff. So if you have... Uh, wind blown rain and it dribbles in you know you get 18 inches of rain in six hours and it dribbles in around a skylight or something like that and the insured's laptop is sitting on the you know or their water drips onto their nice uh, dining room table and causes a big it ruins the finish and makes a big stain or whatever on the on the dining room table this is not applicable under that because this is only for landlords furnishings um, there's no other place in this particular policy that I looked for it because I was this is a big one um, there's no other place in this policy which has this language that applies to the insured's personal property um, so in other words if there's no damage to the outside of the house if you just have too much rain it, it kind of overcame the the parameters of, or the you know the the parameters of the house and how the if water will find a way in, you know, if there's a if there's any way to exploit any tiny pinhole anywhere, and if you get enough water on it, the water will find a way and it'll eventually drip in. So if that happens, if there's no storm damage to the outside of the house, then um, in stuff that's on the inside of the house will be covered. I've seen a lot of policies where it's not. So this is a big one because you will see this on hail, hail claims. Um, So let's skip out of here and we're going to go down to... Ordinance or law, um, you've got coverage. Uh, you may use up to 10% of the limit of liability. Um, this is important to know because f- primarily for roofing, if you have um, insured's got a regular roof on their house and they don't have ice and water shield, if their county or municipality has a code requirement that any roofs that put, are put on um, require uh, ice and water shield, you know, along the eaves and maybe up the valleys and maybe along the rakes, um, you have to address that in your estimate. And depending on what company you work for, um, you may put it in there as a code upgrade item, which doesn't pay them anything until it's incurred, because the inc- incur is the key word right here, right in the middle of the paragraph. Um, so, but you, and you, you definitely can't pay it up front unless they, you know, they've already done the work or whatever. Uh, so now we're going to get down here and back down to this section, perils insured against. Already 30 minutes in. That's amazing. So there's one sentence here that tells me that this policy is a open peril policy. And this basically means right here, we insure against risk of direct physical loss to property described in coverages A, B, and C. So the property that's described in these this area is insured for direct physical loss. Um, it doesn't say any, there's no other qualifiers on this sentence. So what this means is, is that basically if it's not excluded, so we do not insure however for loss excluded 
Um, if if something happens to the, the insurance house or their personal property or, or whatever, and it's not excluded anywhere in the policy, then it, this is saying that it's covered. So it's an open peril policy, which is in contrast to the named peril stuff that we've got up here under landlord's furnishings. And then we had, what was the other thing we had in here? Oh, tree shrubs and other plants. We have these seven things, which these are named perils for this particular coverage. Um, but the whole policy in general is open peril. But so sec section one perils insured against. We've got one little sentence here that says it's open peril and what's covered. And then two pages of we do not insure, however, for blah, 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 which is all this stuff. Um, freezing, thawing, pressure, or weight of water or ice. This is not covered, whether driven by wind, rain, or not, to a fence. Important pavement, important patio, swimming pool, footing, foundation, bulkhead, wall, uh, retaining wall, uh, pier, wharf, or dock. So freezing, thawing, pressure, weight of water or ice, whether or driven by wind or not. So if you, any snow, in this particular case, I had a claim um, where I had patio cover that collapsed, which is covered, by the way. Um, but fence is not, and the insured had a six foot wood privacy fence that was kind of enclosed in their little patio cover area for privacy or whatever. I paid for the, the patio cover and that fence as part of the claim, kind of in my mind, I was saying, well, this is part of the patio cover because it was kind of weird because they, they had another fence that went around the whole yard. Um, when the quality assurance guy went to look at that claim, um, I got dinged for an overwrite because I added in you know, $900 worth of fence and stain and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this this is something that you have to uh, pay attention to when you're doing claims like this. Um, you do have to definitely dip into the policy and make sure that you understand it and, and that you've seen this stuff before um, and keeping in mind that the policies that you might get um, sent to you when you show up on a storm site might be a little bit different than this and have different language depending on the state and the company uh, that you're with in the form as well. So um, mold, fungus, or wet rot <clears throat> is not covered. However, this is a great policy because it says that mold, fungus, or wet rot that is hidden within the walls or ceilings or beneath the floors, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, if such loss results from the accidental discharge or overflow of water or steam within... So in other words, if you've got um, something that leaks... It springs a leak, and it causes hidden uh, rot uh, or mold or fungus um, that you can't see. And it's discovered when the uh, when the insured goes in to do the repairs. Um, then this opens up for mold remediation, um, which adds you know obviously some money to the estimate if they got to wear spacesuits and respirators and all that stuff. Um, and then, of course, 2A2, <clears throat> A2E. So this section right here, um, A2E, you're going to see this in, it's, the language is going to be really similar in most policies that you see. And this is where you're going to find where wear and tear is not covered, um, deterioration is not covered, mechanical breakdown is not covered, um, in this particular one, we've got uh, birds, vermin, rodents, or insects, which is not in every policy. Some policies will cover um, damage caused by these things, um, or at least vermin, which is, includes, I think, like raccoons and stuff. Uh, settling, shrinking, bulging, or expansion, including result in cracking. So cracking that's caused by settling, shrinking, bulging, or expansion uh, of any of these things. We've got bulkheads, pavements, patios, footings, foundations, walls, floors, roofs, or ceilings. So you've got stair-step cracks. Um, from settling primarily is what you're going to see and you're going to have to do denials for um, because they happen over time and it's not covered. Um, exceptions, unless the loss is otherwise excluded, we cover loss to property covered under coverage A, B, or C resulting from an accidental discharge or overflow of water from steam from storm drain or water steam or sewer pipe uh, off the residence premises or plumbing, heating, uh, et cetera, or household appliance. Um, on the residence premises. Um, and in this case, this is basically, this, this section right here is saying that ensuing loss from one of these things 
is covered. So if you have water, so if you have it, an appliance that's damaged there that breaks and like a refrigerator and the, the water line breaks inside and it ruins the floor in the kitchen, the ruined floor is covered, but the, the refrigerator is not covered. So if that makes any sense, that, that's to help to keep this section simple. You're not going to see this on a cat, but if you do any daily at all, you're going to see this constantly. This is one of the, the main big time claims that you get doing daily or being a staff adjuster. Um, all right, moving along quickly here. Uh, now, so we had perils insured against, which showed what wasn't covered. Now we've got a section called exclusion, exclusions, which shows more of what's not covered. We do not insure for loss directly, caused directly or indirectly by any of the following. Um, such loss is excluded regardless of any other cause or event contributing concurrently or in any sequence to the loss, which is, this is the um, concurrent causation clause in the policy, meaning that you have two losses together, one's covered and one's not covered. Um, the not covered part is still not covered, no matter if the, the covered part is. So if you have uh, this, this like you get a California, you know, mudslide situation, but you got heavy rains, and they have some coverage for wind uh, that's associated with the storm, and maybe some, you know, shingles blew off, and they had some water damage inside the house, but also their retaining wall fell over, and their whole backyard is swamped in mud. Concurrent causation doesn't matter. Um, we're not going to be able to pay for the any of the mudslide stuff um, but we can pay for obviously the other part um, earth movement is not covered and in this case for the purposes of uh, cat we're talking about landslide mudslide or mud flow um, earth sinking rising or shifting any other earth movement subsidence or sinkhole um, these things are going to be uh, not covered. Um, there is a section here at the bottom of this this paragraph that says um, we'll pay for um, ensuing damage from fire or explosion caused by any of those things, but nothing else. And then water damage, our good, you know, our favorite here. So water damage is any flood, surface water, waves, tidal water, overflow of a body of water, or spray from any of these, whether driven by wind. Uh, water, which backs up through sewers or drains or which overflows or is discharged from a sump, sump pump, or related equipment. Or water uh, below the surface of the ground, including water which exerts pressure, pressure on or seeps or leaks through a building, sidewalk, driveway, foundation, swimming pool, or other structure um, caused by anything. <clears throat> this is when rain hits the ground. This is, as a cat adjuster, this is what you're going to see. As soon as water touches the ground, it's not covered. It's, it's either surface water it seeps into the so, soaks into the ground and comes into the wall then it is water um, below the surface of the ground um, which seeps or leaks through a building sidewalk driveway foundation um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is the big part that excludes a lot of water damage in, or excludes all, pretty much all water damage to, to basements from any kind of a storm um, if you have you know a tree hits the side of the house and puts a great big hole in it and water rains in because the insured was out of town all through the weekend and they get a bunch of water damage in the basement from that because the water leaked in all the way down to the basement. Well, that's covered because it, the source is from the roof. It's not from this. But if they just have, you know, some shingles blown off the roof, but then water was pouring in through the wall in the basement, which I've seen. Um, it's uh, I'm gonna turn this off. Um it's just not going to be covered, and you're going to be writing a lot of denial letters for that. So power failure, you're going to hear this one a lot. Um, failure of power or other utility service, if the failure takes place off of the residence premises, is not covered. Um, so if you have a general power goes off in the neighborhood and you lose all the food in your fridge, um, it is not covered. If you have a tree that falls over in your yard and pulls the power line off the side of the house and there's no power into the house because there's no power because the line's off, that's on premises. Um, even if the tree is off premises and it pulls the line off, and, but it damages your house and it pulls the power line off of your house, that's still on premises, uh, an on premises power failure. And that would mean that your food, refrigerated food loss is covered. So um, generally speaking, you're not going to have much more than refrigerated food loss on cat claims from this kind of a thing. And there, there's usually going to be other damage to the house um, a lot of times, or people will not file a claim for that unless there's decent damage or the tree caused a bunch of other damage so 
Okay. Conditions. Insurance duties after a loss. We're almost done here. Thank you guys so much for hanging with me. Um, the conditions, this is something that um, sometimes the insured will say, well, I don't want, you know, I don't want to, you coming over here, da, da 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 let me just send you pictures or let me, you know, why can't I just file a claim for da 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 da, da. You are, they are required as by the terms of the, pol the policy, um, as often as we require to show us the damaged property and provide us with records and documents. Um, so they have to comply with us in, as part of our investigation of the claim, whether or not we're going to pay the claim or not. So they, they and 90, I mean, it's, it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people are going to give you a hard time about this. Usually you're, you're answering questions about this one, which is protect the property from further damage. So um, if the insured complains that, um, you know, well, th there's another storm coming tonight, you know, the storm happened two days ago and there's another one coming tonight, you know, what am I supposed to do? Da, da, da. They are required to protect their property from further damage, doing whatever is reasonable and necessary, and we'll pay for it. And if they take pictures and keep an accurate record of repair expenses, that's no problem. So when you're talking to a customer and you say, you know, hey, Mr. Jones, um, I could be out there um, a week from Monday at five o'clock and he flips his lid because he can't wait that long because he's got, you know, the storms are coming, da, 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 da. Then you just say, listen, you're, you're, please, by all means, go ahead and get started doing the repairs, um, take pictures. Um, you've got to protect your property from further damage. I mean, leave as much f as possible for me to see, but take photos as you go. Um, and this is what helps you when you get a huge uh, influx of claims on a hurricane where they might hand you 70 claims. And there's no way. I mean, there's simply it's impossible to get it to everybody in a week. You're just It's just not going to happen unless... No, there's just no way. Um, this is where you tell them, you say, just go ahead and get started. Because sometimes their contractor is is in big demand and there's no way, you know, he's can either he can either do it this afternoon or it's going to be in a month. So tell them, do it. Go ahead and do it. Take photos. Keep, you know, just keep copy, keep a record of everything um, so that I can see it and we'll take care of it. No, no big deal. As long as, you know, it's, it's covered and you've established that in your conversation with them. Um, so that is the duties after the loss under loss settlement. Um, this is where we're going to talk about replacement cost and actual cash value. Under loss settlement, this was where it tells us um, where these things are. And this is on page 14. <clears throat> These items, personal property, awnings, carpeting, household appliances, outdoor antennas or outdoor equipment, whether or not attached to buildings, structures that are not buildings, and of course, grave markers, including mausoleums, are always paid at actual cash value. Actual cash value. Where it says, at the time of loss, but not more than the amount required to repair or replace. Um, I don't even... This, if it says this, that these are paid at actual cash value, then you have to pay them an actual cash value. There's this this clause right here doesn't open up replacement cost for fence if it's not uh, if it's if it's not or you know awnings or carpeting or whatever. If it says here that it's an actual cash value, then you can only pay actual cash value for those things. Structures that are not buildings are fences. This is going to be the main thing that that's what this is. Um, buildings under coverage A or B, and also personal property. This is a big one. Um, sometimes, you know, when people buy these these, these particular policies, almost 100% of the time, they will have an endorsement that gives them coverage for uh, that gives them coverage for their personal property for replacement costs. So they that open that'll give them replacement, and it's like $14 a year or something like. That. It's crazy. It's super cheap. I had one instance on a, the insured had a 40 by 60 um, detached garage that was full of, I mean, there was there was over $100,000 worth of personal property items in there because they sent me their list. Um, they did not have the personal property replacement coverage on their uh, deck sheet. Called the agent, he confirmed it, and then when I went to talk to the insured about it, she lost her mind and, and you know... Uh, said that I was crazy and there was going to be a lawsuit and all this kind of stuff. But the the agent had the, the document. If somebody turns down this kind of property, the insured has to sign something saying, I turned down this particular coverage. Um, same thing for like, places that are prone to sewer and drain, like sewer and drain backup endorsements, which is mainly the Midwest where, you, you know, you get a lot of rain uh, or you can get a lot of rain or really heavy rains that'll cause um, 
you know, over the short term, that'll cause water to back up into the house. Um, that's another one that people have to sign a piece of paper that says, I decline this particular coverage. And the agents have that stuff. And that's what covers their rear ends when the insureds blow their tops and this particular kind of thing. So keep in mind, personal property is actual cash value unless it's endorsed. So check the deck sheet. The deck sheet should be available. Um, on your loss report, it should say what the coverages are, but you can get into exact analysis and also see this information. So, um, but buildings are, that are covered under uh, building buildings under A and B um, are covered under replacement costs without deduction for depreciation, subject to the following. And then there's a bunch of yada yada here about insured value, which I mean. I've, I can't tell you the number of hours of classes I've sat through where I talk about co-insurance and insured value calculations. I've never done that in my entire career, ever, on CAT. So I ignore that stuff. What we want to talk about here, though, is that we will pay no more than the actual cash value of the damage until actual repair or replacement is complete. Uh, once actual repair or replacement is complete, we will settle the loss as noted and blah, 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 above. This tells you, when you have that conversation with the homeowner... Um, where you're saying, all right, your first payment is the, you know, this is the actual cash value payment is going to be 50% of the roof. And then when the, everything's done, when you finish the work, you show me that it's done, then we'll give you the other 50%. You can pay off the contractor and away you go. This section here is where that, that language is. If, if you're in a, if you're looking at a policy and it doesn't have this in there, you're going to go by what the carrier directs you to do. Because this particular policy, I don't see this very often in policies, but it's actually in here for you to, to read. So, um, but it says, however, if the cost of repair or replace damage is both, both is the key word here. Number one, less than five percent of the amount of insurance in this policy on the building, and less than twenty five hundred dollars, we will settle uh, without. Um, Replacement costs without deducting for depreciation up front. Stand by. Okay. So, but in this case, you're thinking, well, that probably wouldn't come up. If it's less than $2,499 and less, I'm just paying, um, I'm just paying, I don't have to deduct for depreciation. Of course, keeping in mind that the deductible still comes off of that. So this isn't like $2,500 after the, the deductible is taken. It's going to be, $2,500, and then the deductible comes off. So the, the total amount of the loss, right? This doesn't say anything about deducting for the deductible. Um, but in certain situations <clears throat> where this 5% of the amount of insurance comes into play is, is that you say you have an, an outbuilding that is leveled by wind or it was burned up by in a wildfire, um, that building is covered at 10% of the uh, coverage A, you know, in general, um, oh, where am I going with this? It's got to be smaller than that. So under, you might have damage to, okay, that, that is actually a good example. So you have, you know, $100,000 uh, coverage A, 10% of that is $10,000 to cover your one outbuilding that was, that was complete, that was damaged. The damage to that outbuilding is Two thousand dollars, or it's twenty four hundred dollars, twenty four hundred ninety nine dollars. We'll just say, well, twenty twenty four hundred ninety nine dollars is not f is is twenty five percent of the coverage, so it's not going to to satisfy both this and this. It's only going to satisfy number two here and not one and two. So you can't. You still have to depreciate if you have even, you know, a thousand dollar damage to that outbuilding. You still have to depreciate. Um, because it's not f less than 5% of the, that coverage. So $1,000 out of $10,000 is 10%. So it, ha it would have to be $500 or less in order to satisfy both of these on that outbuilding. So you, in this particular policy, um, you got to know this. And this is this one of these, this, this, this kind of thing right here is something that comes up <coughs> in orientations. Um, it's probably going to be in the estimating guidelines. Um, this is something that probably gets um, the attention of managers when adjusters don't do it right. So they're going to make sure that during orientation or in the, the packet of information that they email you, it, should, it would probably say something about this. And, the, you know, those packets are going to have a lot of information about um, policy stuff like this. And it's very, very important that you read it and not just skim it because you can get zinged pretty good if you, you know, 
if you do stuff like if you if you pay for things the wrong way, um, you're not going to be you know, the customer might like you, but the your managers are going to be a little bit upset with you. So, um, okay, I think that is everything in here. Yep. Okay. So that wraps up our tour of the H05 policy. Um, again, I, I really appreciate you guys sticking around for this. This, this was a really long one, and I went really super fast. <clears throat> um, so going to go ahead and open it up for Q&A right now. Um, but don't forget, you can go over to uh, adjustertv.com and uh, forward slash policy and you can download a copy of that policy right there also those five uh, practice questions are in there and then there's uh there's a what you call it the answers to the questions the way i the way i interpreted the policy um i put those answers in there and you can at the very bottom of the screen there's after the end of the questions you can click and and get those answers and if you guys come up with something different or if you have a question or um and you have a different interpretation by all means um bring it back to you know our Facebook group and we can talk about it because I can't tell you the number of times I've sat down uh, with managers and the the especially when I was working at Liberty Mutual sitting down with their counsel and talking about a coverage issue and usually it was you know I'm trying to pay for something and trying to sort of figure out a way in the policy to uh, get something paid for and walking through sort of my analysis of why we should pay for it and and then listening to them tell me you know either why I'm they're not we're not going to pay for it because of this other thing that I didn't see or hey great point Matt we're actually going to pay for that so um anyway yes the live session will absolutely be uh available later um right in here of course and uh again I mean <laughs> The policy, there's a lot to cover in the policy, and I, I literally hit every single thing that you, the, of all of the things that you're going to possibly run into, 99% of the time, I hit them all. So, and I did it in 51 minutes or whatever it was. So, um, I can understand if you guys don't have any questions right now, if you're sort of overwhelmed with all of that. Um, but I'm going to hang out here for a few minutes and welcome any questions that you guys have and I also wanted to tell you guys that this is part one of three next week <clears throat> I'm going to try to do a much shorter video and what I'm going to go through is policy analysis so what we did today was we basically took a tour of the policy and you know I, I, I real it's literally like just barely touched the surface of, of most of those those points in there um, but with the policy analysis, um, when you sit down, when you get a new claim, especially if you're doing daily or you're doing like hurricane claims or you're doing something a little bit more complicated than hail, because generally speaking, hail is pretty cut and dried, especially um, once you've done a few claims in a neighborhood, you kind of have an idea of everything that's going to be damaged and everything that's covered. Um, but with policy analysis, you still want to you still want to hit these points. You want to make sure that you you've looked after you talk to the customer you find out they'll tell you what things are damaged and you go through the policy and find out if those are damaged and if they have any limits and then you you, you want to put that in your activity diary or in your general loss or in your your log notes or whatever it is um to uh so that people when they when they look at your file they can kind of see they can sort of follow the story of your claim and see how you came up with what you did um so policy analysis is a really big deal and it's the next thing we're going to go over next week Um, fifteen hundred dollars trailers can should be paid by both. Oh no! So Erica asked if you have a uh, fifteen hundred dollars uh, limit for the trailer, um, and then say the insured. Well, say it's let's let's say it's like a a pontoon boat. I think it, we'll just use that same example. Um, if it's you know if it's a decent pontoon boat. The insured probably, you know, talk to their agent about it, and the agent said, "Well, you, let's get you a rider for that boat. Let's get you a boat policy or whatever." Um, you can't be paid by both. Um, the fifteen hundred dollars from the policy 
not to get too far into the weeds, but with condo policies, sometimes you can do that. Um, there might be two different kinds of coverages that you can sort of stack them. You can't really do that. I've never done that um, with the, any of the companies that I've ever worked for. Um, again, but I mean, anything's possible. I mean, that's like I said, I mean, that, that uh, patio cover that I paid for for weight of snow and then paid for the fence that was around it for weight of snow damage got zinged on it. I did that last year. I've been doing this, you know, forever. So it's, that's something that I missed in the policy for, you know, 19 or 20 years. Um, are you able to go over coverage with insureds? Um, it depends on the company. Uh, Alina asked, are you able to go over coverage with, the with insureds? I'm, I'm guessing. Um, depends on the, the agreement that the carrier and the IA firm have with each other. Um, can you still hear me over there? Okay. Um, so basically, most of the companies that I've ever worked for, with a couple of exceptions, <clears throat> they want you to do the coverage, the policy analysis, they want you to scope the loss, they want you to write the estimate, and then they want you to, to sit down with the customer, either over, over the phone or at their kitchen table, and go over all the coverages and go over the whole estimate, go over depreciation, go over all that stuff. They want you to start to finish. They want you to do the whole thing. Um, a lot of companies want you to do that. Some companies, all they want you to do is be an estimator. So they'll, the desk adjuster handles everything. The desk adjuster you know, calls the insured. Um, they're the main point of contact. You just show up with your ladder and your camera. You take, do your scope and you write the estimate and then you re-upload that back to the desk adjuster and the desk adjuster takes it from there. Um, that's kind of common. I was seeing some of that with the Irma and stuff because there were so many new people um, who weren't policy savvy. They didn't want them out there talking out their ear about something they have no idea what they're talking about. So they just had them do estimates and then not commit to any coverages and then let the desk adjuster decide, yes, it's covered, no, it's not covered, yes, it's covered up to this special limit or, you know, whatever. So how long did it take me to learn... Jasmine, how long did it take me to, to learn policy? You learn bits and pieces as you go, and it's one of those kind of things where when something new comes up, I mean, you could sit down and read the policy from start to finish and, you know, try to memorize it or try to remember things. I mean, you could do that, I guess. Or you could, I don't know. I, I learned it bit, bits and pieces. You learn a lot when you, when you get your licenses. You're going to be you're going to be learning more about insurance. I mean, you guys, most of you have uh, licenses. You've learned like 90% more about insurance than you're ever going to use. You're going to use about 10% of all that licensing stuff um, for your adjuster licenses. When things p come up, um, those are usually the learning experiences typically for me. And I would say doing uh, all hail damage for the first three years. I mean, hail is, it's pretty straightforward. Um, most things are covered with hail. Uh, Erica asks, these policies, H03, H05, are they all the same? So there's a base, there's a, there's kind of a base policy that's called the ISO policy, um, which is, stands for, somebody's going to correct me later, but I think it stands for insurance services organization or something like that. The policies are, have to have certain things in them by law because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, case law that goes into how the policies are written. You know, if there's something that's covered or not covered in the policy, generally not covered. Somebody sues the insurance company and gets it covered, then they have to start changing all the policies. The policies will vary carrier to carrier. So, for example, um, the when I lived in Washington, I was working for Safeco, which is a brand of Liberty Mutual. And so I had to learn both policies. And the policies were they're their layouts were totally different. And it was really kind of frustrating because you find out where something is in the Safeco policy. It's not in the same place or even in the same wording in the Liberty policy. And they had, you know, the same basic coverages like the actual cash value stuff, the special limits, you know, things like that, um, the duties and the conditions and all those things. But then the Safeco policy uh, would would add they they can add things to the policy they can't take away anything from the base policy but they can add things like and the, the number one thing I'm thinking about which I thought was awesome about Safeco is that 
if you have like three layers of roofing, like you have two layers of composition shingle and then you have a layer of wood shake at the bottom, which is very common, you guys will see it. Um, when in the Safeco policy, and the same thing with siding, in the Safeco policy it says, if you have more than one layer of material on the house for co a covering, you can pick which one you want to go back with. Um, so in other words, you could say, you know, if you've got an ugly three tab on there that's, you know, 19 years old and the it's got two other layers and then it's got the, you know, the, the wood shake underneath, you can tear all that off and put wood shake on, which I thought was insane, but very awesome. Nothing like that in the Liberty policy. Um, so, and that's in the same state, the same form. Um, yeah, you don't have to read. The only time we really have to read the show insured sections of the policy is when you deny something and they're like, what? Why do we even have insurance? You know, where does it say that in there? Show me. And you break out the policy and there, there it is. Sorry. Um, seems in our experience, IACAT, they don't want us to add money to claim when they go back later and increase claim amount. The key, um, Jasmine, if you, if you, well, in my experience, if I write a thorough estimate, there I've never had anybody s say to take things out of my estimate that are supposed to be there, so that they could put them in later, so that I would get, get knocked out of my fee. If you're working for somebody that's you think is actually doing that, then I would quit immediately, because that's that's against the law. Um, Audrey asks, are a lot of the policies the same? You'll find, or I found on CAT. Um, that you'll have like 90% or HO5s or like a comprehensive, everything is covered. Um, s that particular policy I showed you guys had re personal property as um, actual cash value unless it had an endorsement on it. But some other policies from other insurance companies will have, they'll just, uh, personal property, property will automatically be replacement cost and that won't even be in there. Um, so there have little different tweaks like that in them. Generally speaking, you're going to get um, a big zip folder that's going to have all the policies that you're going to need. And like I said, it's going to be a generally HO5. Um, and then you're going to have like the, the other 10%, you might have a little like landlord policy in there. And you might have like an HO3 or like a DP, they call them dwelling policies, which are super basic. Like a DP1 is all ACV. Um, and they're I don't think they sell them anymore, but you'll see them occasionally. They're kind of grandfathered in. But um, no, they're not the same. But when you're on Storm, you're going to be seeing a lot of the same. Like a vast majority are going to be like just one particular policy. And then a s small sliver will be the weird ones that are like you have to, to read the policy to see if it's ACV or not. Or if the roof is covered or if it's not covered or if this is excluded or if it's name peril. Um, Big Blue is all state. Big Red is State Farm. Any other burning questions? Is there somewhere that says all of that lingo, like DP or dwelling policy and, and all ACV? Oh, so all the the acronyms? Uh, yes. So when you see, like Erica asked, um, is there somewhere that says, it's kind of like dis deciphers all of the, the acronyms and the lingo and everything. When you get assigned claims and you... Uh, Download, download your claims and you print out the loss reports, the loss report will say on it something like HO5, you know, Silver Star or something like that. Or it'll say DP3. Uh, if you, when you go to look at that policy, like the, usually the packet you get, the zip file that you get from your, you know, whoever deployed you, they'll have a, a folder that has the policies in it and it'll say DP1, 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 and with a bunch of stuff after it, and then DP3, and then HO3, HO5, HO6. Click on, double click on DP1, and it'll pop up, and the first thing it says on top is dwelling policy. So DP stands for dwelling policy when it comes to policies. Um, ACV. Yeah, I mean, I could put together a cheat sheet for that. Let me make a note of it here, standby over. Um, Make a lingo cheat sheet. Bold. Okay, I'll definitely do that because, you know, it's it's one of those things like when you throw the lingo around because you've heard it 10,000 million times over the course of the years um, and then 
people who've never heard it before are like, what what language are you speaking again? Um, so, hubby thought roof should be replaced. Firm came back and said no, Jasmine says. Um, then later he saw that file and the carrier sent out another gesture and they replaced he lost it on a gigantic amount. Yeah, I truthfully, I, I've just never had a carrier or an IA firm or a QA person. If I, if I, but again, um, the companies that I work for mainly, um, they want you to settle on site and everything. So if I go out to the house and I say the roof's totaled and hand them a copy of the estimate, what'll happen is, and it's only happened, I think, once. And that was in, that was in, I can remember that, that was in Northern Missouri uh, a few years ago. The, um, that was actually when we were staying at that Platte River place, Dean. Um, the QA went back out and looked at, looked at a bunch of my files and another adjuster's files, and, and uh, he basically called us together and said, hey, you guys are doing a really great job taking care of our insureds, but let's uh, tighten up our scopes a little bit because some of that stuff was hard to, hard to see, the hail damage that you, were, you guys are paying for. And that's a shot across the bow saying, you know, let's not pay for more roofs like this. But they're not taking, they're not taking money away. They're not, you know, um, if you just go out and scope the loss and you write an estimate for to replace the roof and the insurance company doesn't agree and you didn't commit to it, then that's going to be another, probably another, they're trying to maintain control of the claim. Um, if they send somebody back, I mean, it's, it's hard to know what's going on there. I mean, if they send another IA out or if they sent their desk adjuster out, um, I would personally, in that, in that circumstance, I would call my vendor manager, whoever, you know, the IA firm I'm working for, and say, hey, listen, you know, I totaled that roof, and I saw it again in an exact analysis, and somebody came, somebody else came out back out. They said they couldn't pay for it, and now they're saying they are paying for it, and it got totaled and got paid for. You know, that's not very cool. Um, is there any way I can bill for that, or you guys can, you know, at least maybe split the bill with the other adjuster or something, and then maybe just bail on that storm and go do, go find somebody else better to work for, because that sounds like baloney. If a house, Audrey says, if a house had a power outage and the food in the freezer and the refrigerator is spoiled, would that be covered? Um, yes, but with depending on the the policy, and this is one of those things. If you go on a storm where there is, you're going to have power outage and food food spoilage. It's going to be on most of your claims. It's going to be, you know, generally speaking, it'll be because it, it'll be like a widespread thing. <clears throat> there should be this particular policy. I don't think I saw it. Um, we can look in there, but um, yeah, there's usually the policy will say this one doesn't say it. I, I did it. Uh, control F to search through the policy. You can type in keywords, which is a big deal. Which is wonderful with PDFs. Um, but they'll they'll have a separate endorsement for food coverage. Um, and it'll say whether the f whether the the power outage occurred on premises or off premises, the food the refrigerated food loss is covered up to five hundred dollars or up to to seven hundred fifty dollars per unit. So in other words, if you had a fridge in your kitchen and then you had deep freeze in the basement, power went out and you lost everything in both of those, you'd have a limit of you know we'll say five hundred dollars for the fridge upstairs, and then you have another limit downstairs if you had like a side of beef in it or some game meat or a bunch of you know frozen you know tv dinners and stuff you lost all that stuff and then you have another five hundred dollars for that unit in the basement um so but that's something that they'll they'll definitely co cover in the orientation and it'll show up on usually they'll have like a storm storm notes or you know storm there's a sheet that has lists off all the things that really really um are important that they want you to focus on and that's generally one of those things that pops up erica asks on hail claims um, is it a carrier specific rule that we each have different views on what determines how many hail hits in a test credit of full placement or that information come from your manager daily claims for you in Texas personally? Um, it's going to be carrier to carrier. The carrier is going to have its, its own general rules for, uh, what constitutes or what, what's the, what the threshold is that you have to get past in order to total a roof. So for American family, um, and they, they change it. They change it like every year. But it, it used to be if it was 50% of the roof, so if you had a straight gable, 12 squares on the front, 12 squares on the back, and they wanted to see eight hits 
in a square would total that particular directional slope. Um, if you had the front slope, and this is what made working for American Family so great, is that I could total a roof with one slope if it was a neighborhood that had all little gables in it. Um, all I needed to do was total out the front slope and then the roof's total, and that was 50%. Then they changed it to they wanted 51%, which that was like, how are you supposed to figure out 51%? So they redefined that to say it's 51% means that if you find, we'll just, you know, just give us a couple of hits on the back or, if, you know, some, some kind of damage on the back. If it's, you know, this, the, both the slopes are the same size, then you can total that roof. Um, other companies are going to say they want to have 60% of the roof, um, that, you know, totaled. And then once you get, once you have 60% of the slopes, however, you know, whatever kind of roof it is, then you can total the roof. Um, some are 100%. They'll only pay for the actual damage. Um, I think Safeco even did that. I, I don't think that we could like, there was like a, a little shortcut where you could just do 51% of where they wanted to, if you had uh, four slopes and you found damage on three of the slopes and you couldn't find damage on the last slope, you just couldn't pay for that last slope. But that's something that they'll go over. It'll they'll say, um, uh, they might do the repair difficulty factor. Well, I won't get into that stuff. But the, usually it's eight to ten hits per square. Uh, your mistake only five shingles missing. I'm sorry. Let me let me back up a little bit here. Audrey Audrey asked, um, Matt, can you go back over why water isn't covered that comes inside the home? So it's it's not water in general. It's water from specific sources. So. Let's see if we can pull this thing up here real quick. Watch this. Okay. Is it scrolling? Yep. Okay, so water damage. Let me cruise down here to um, the, the policies don't want to pay for water damage um, from specific sources for a couple of reasons. And let me find this here real quick. Well, let's do this. Water. Uh, we do not insure, however, for loss um, caused by water damage. So it's it's number three down here. It's not that water damage isn't covered. It's that water damage um, that occurs as a result of flood. Flood. Wait. Let's do this right. Flood surface water um, and the two main things that we're going to be concerned with as as uh, uh, cat adjusters although waves and tidal water this is storm surge is also not covered um, anything that comes up from a sump sump pump uh, well or related equipment is not covered um, probably about to lose my signal here. I think I just ran out of data. And then, what's that? Oh. Um, this one here seeps through the foundation. These two things are the main things that exclude water. So mainly it's when you have heavy, heavy rains and water hits the ground. Rain drops, touch the ground, and whatever they do from there, anything that they try to do, anything water tries to do after it touches the ground is not going to be covered when it gets into the house. If it doesn't touch the ground, it's still covered. So like, like I said, the, the best example is if you have the tree, great big tree limb lands on the roof and put punctures a great big hole in there, water comes in and damages everything, it's totally covered, no problem. Um, if you have a pipe freeze, uh, and water fills the house and destroys everything in there. The frozen, that particular cause of loss is covered, so that will be covered. If you have um, your dishwasher or your washing machine breaks and uh, causes water to leak out, you know, like I said, usually it happens when people go out, of t they, they start the washing machine as they're leaving for vacation for the weekend, and then the thing breaks and water just sits there and runs out over the floor and, and all of their wood floor is all cupped up and their carpet's ruined and the drywall's all, you know. It's, though that's covered. The damage, or the, the failure of the, d the dishwasher is not covered, but the ensuing damage is. It's, jeez. It's just the, 
uh, fact of water touching the ground, if it's on the surface, like flood water or water rushing, you know, from like the storm drains, you know, can't keep up with the rain and the water rushes in that way, um, that's not covered. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Am I still on? Oh. Uh, all right. I'm going to take one more because I think I'm about to lose my connection. Uh, yeah, Erica. So in a test square, what would that equal? 15 or more in a test square would constitute 60%? No. Basically, you take a 10 by 10 square foot area, so a, sort of a sample of that particular directional slope. So we'll say the front slope of the house um, as an example. In that particular square, you need to find a minimum of, say, eight hail impacts on that slope, right? That will total that, that one little square, 10 by 10 square of eight hits is a sample of the whole roof. So basically they're saying, we're assuming that there's eight hits every, you know, 100 square feet all over this thing. That totals that particular slope. That's 50% of the roof. The back slope, you don't find any damage on it at all. Then you do, it's not, is that, am I? <laughs> oh, did I get off in the weeds there a little bit? Um, but no, it's the 60% is this of the surface area of the roof. So if you have a bunch of different slopes on the roof, you know, if you add, if you take the grand total of the roof and it's 50 squares, um, but all of the damaged slopes come up to 20 squares, well, that's not 50%. If they come up to, you know, 30, 30 squares, that's 60% or something like that. It might be over. So anyway, I'll just wrap this up by saying thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate you sitting through this long thing. And I hope I hope that this this kind of thing can help you. And again, you can watch it on a replay um, and kind of dig a little bit deeper deeper into it. But don't forget um, to head over to AdjusterTV.com. Um, uh, sorry, AdjusterTV.com forward slash policy and um, download this policy look it over and then answer those uh, practice questions. And like I said, you know, policies can be open to interpretation. So if you, if you come up with something different or you don't agree with what I, what I, what I came up with for my reading of the policy, by all means, you can email me at Matthew at adjustertv.com or we can talk about it in uh, the Facebook group. Um, but again, this is part one of three. Part two is next week. And thank you guys so much for watching and have a great night.